mentioned, we're going to get started. we're going to get started shortly. But there is a quick poll up on the screen, and so if you would please uh, just complete the poll, just one question, uh, just select the one that is correct or that is the closest for you, and click submit, and we should be good to go shortly. Quite a few more people still making their way into the webinar room, and we are going to kick off in just a minute or so. I feel like I may have cheated by answering the poll, but that's fine. <laughs> well, I, I feel like I know what answer you picked. Okay. <laughs> How to unlock more capital from E squared. Uh, listen, eh? I'm not the one to talk about that. That, that section is not for me. <laughs> One more time, hello to all of those that have uh, made their way into the webinar room. We will get started in about a minute or so. Um, if you would kindly ensure that your video is off, your microphone is on mute, and then please complete the poll that is up on the screen right now. Um, I'm gonna give it another minute and then we will kick off. Just waiting for everybody to select the answer that is best suited for them. All right, Audrey, it looks like we are good to go. Um, I think we can end the poll and we can, there will be a couple more opportunities and some polls will come as we continue. But for now, let's kick off tonight's session. I am super excited. I can assure you, I would be nowhere else right now than right here online with every single one of you that have tuned in for Get Real with Entrepreneurship brought to you by the Alan Gray Foundation and E-Square. Thank you so much. My name is Darren August. I will be your host for this evening. I, and as I said, I'm super excited. I literally cut my hair. I'm literally wearing perfume. I literally put on a jacket. The, the, the reason I've got a jacket is because my wife said, you're going to be interviewing someone who is like worth over a billion dollars. And so you can't show up looking like just anything, okay? And so we'll see. But as I get to know him better, I'll take my jacket off and look a little bit like him. But we are in for a great, great time this evening. Um, my name is Darren August, as I mentioned, I am an entrepreneur myself. I am the founder of Inspired Publishing and I help first time authors write and publish their first book. And so all of the books at the back on my bookshelf have all been published by my company, which is Inspired Publishing. And I think one of the things that excites me most about the Alan Gray Foundation and eSquared is that it is all about dreams. I think that's the one thing that connected me to what we're about to discuss this evening, as I love the fact that we're talking to a dreamer, we're talking to a visionary. And so I love the fact that a big part of what the organization does is attack poverty, generate business value and drive job creation, which is what most of us on this webinar tonight are about. And so enough about me. I think I'm going to get straight into it and introduce our guest this evening. But before I do that, just a reminder, um, we're going to be together for about 90 minutes this evening. And as I said, it's going to be a great, great discussion. Make sure that your video is off for now. Make sure that your microphone is on mute. But when, later on, when we do have q and I'm going to invite you to raise your hand when you've got a question. And then please put your microphone and your video on so that we can see you. And we can get you, your question nice and loud and clear. All right. So without further delay, it's my absolute privilege to welcome our special guest this evening. His name is Malvin, <laughs> Malvin Lubega. And he's an Alan Gray Fellow co-founder of GoOne, an e-learning ecosystem that gives customers access to the world's largest learning and development library from any web-enabled device. GoOne has offices in five countries and clients in over 20 countries. GoOne is Africa's first edtech startup to achieve unicorn status, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later on, following the closing of a $200 million Series D round that brought GoOne's valuation to over $1 million, sorry, $1 billion <laughs> US dollars. And so, um, Melvin, what a privilege to have you with us this evening. I'm going to allow you to quickly say hello. Hello, oh, hello, and thank you, Darren. I was just looking at my bookshelf earlier and realizing that I wonder if I've read all the books on my bookshelf earlier and published them. Um, and so that was the ultimate flex, but definitely looking forward uh, to this conversation is because of the proximity of this particular community to, to our journey as well. 
So be before we get into the discussion, maybe you want to tell us where you find yourself this evening, because I know you could be anywhere in the world right now, but where exactly are you? If I had to tell you that. So funny enough, you know, I am in another fellow's study, and to believe that the fellow actually isn't joining this call because they decided to go for a run instead of joining this conversation. And so I'm currently in South Africa. <laughs> awesome. Well, it's great to have you um, and great to be with you this evening. And so um, I think just the premise of this conversation is really going to be based off a, a statement that you made in an interview earlier this year. And you said, it's crazy to think how far we've come, but our North Star has remained the same. And then we, we, you, you continue and you say a couple of uh, things after that, but that's really what sets the scene for tonight's discussion. And we're going to be talking about the significance of a clear North Star. We're going to find out what is a North Star, but we also want to know about you and your entrepreneurial journey. And so we're going to get straight into it. I think let's kick off by um, you maybe telling us a little bit about just your background. Where did it all begin for you? Is that your connection or my connection that's bad? Fascinating, Dan. I think I've lost you there for a few seconds. Can you hear me? Okay, I can hear you now. You froze for okay. a moment. I wasn't in the mannequin challenge. I actually didn't freeze. Um, but could you please repeat your last sentence? Okay, so I was asking um, if you would just kick off by telling us where did all of this, where did the entrepreneurial journey begin for you? Let's see. Darren, let's do a quick speed test on my connection. That's wild. No problem. Um, Darren, I know you can hear me now, but I'm just I'm concerned that the speed like is dropping out on my side. But like, I, I came to my to the only fellow who I knew had a UPS and a proper home setup just for this conversation, and now I feel like I'm getting done wrong. But nevertheless, if you could repeat your question again, failing which I'm just for the conversation. Sure thing. So the, the, the first question was for you to just give us a little bit of a background into where it all started for you. Where did the entrepreneurial journey start for you? No, and you know, it's funny one where it depends how far back one chooses to go on the journey to appreciate it. Because, you know, I could think about, I don't know, the first time I went to ask a prince for pocket money they said to spend on what, and I decided to go and clean the green municipal dustbins for everyone in our streets because at that point in time they were all brand new and everyone to keep the dustbins clean so that was like my first play at earning money um but i don't think that was true entrepreneurship and obviously at the foundation we have different views of what entrepreneurship really is but i think for me the question's always been um how can i add value in a space where i find myself um and so from that perspective it's really been doing that and so the first let's say profitable venture because i don't think i counted for my time when i was cleaning dust for five rand um a pop but um, yeah, it was when I was actually in high school. Um, so I was in a scholarship at my high school and to get pocket money, I decided to use the empty storeroom in the common room and build out a mini tuck shop. Um, and look, this is obviously before Uber Eats because I don't think I would have survived in, in the kind of carnage that takes place in the market. But I used to yeah, offer toasted sandwiches a snack in my snackwich machine. And so I used to place the snackwich right by the window so the saw would linger through the boarding house of melted cheese. And we did fairly well on the margins because I got the cheese and the bread from the kitchen. So those are probably the starting of entrepreneurship. But I think the principles always been the same around just thinking through how do you create value and how do you capture value. Um, so, so we know that your your background is in actuarial science. Um, what made you decide to study that? And I think the the question after that is, do you consider yourself to have come from an entrepreneurial family? Yeah. So you know. I think it, I think I'm thinking about African parents would probably say an academic family because the value in education and doing well in schools is prioritized, but I don't think that is mutually excluding an entrepreneur. Um, yeah, look, so the actual science for me was, was interesting, I think, because I've always been fascinated and enjoyed problem solving and specifically quantitative problem solving. And so, you know, just because you do well in maths, you think, what should I go do the maths with? Um, and so for me, at the point, it was choosing between actual science and accounting. Um, and they write here, and no shots to any CAs on the call because I really like what you guys do. But the thing I felt was accounting was about looking in the past and understanding the past, whereas actual science was trying to take data from today and understand the future. And that just sounded very exciting at the time. Um, this was before I applied and spent the next four years 
um, fighting back with the actual science degree, but definitely I think actual science as a quantitative skill set to understand the future uh, and as a problem solving skill set was one which I highly value and I still use today in my work. And so that's that's something which I appreciate. But I think I think about you know the family context. Um, my mother says I'm the last born so far. Um, and so I guess coming from a, a African family where, um, you know, education has been a big part of getting to our family, to where our family is today. I mean, my, my father was again by origin, as is my mother. And I mean, just understanding their narrative and just the role education has played in that. I think, you know, my mother's one of 36 children. And I mean, just the spread of like, you know, aunts and uncles I have, when you get to cousins, the numbers get ridiculous. It's like a permutation equation. But just, you know, appreciating and having a strong sense of, you know, the village where we grew up and just seeing how, look, some of our close relatives are still in a, a very damn poverty-stricken situation, but just the importance of my parents studying hard and they're fortunate to study hard and get scholarships to study in good schools in Uganda and end up studying in the UK and moving around the world. But it really was a function of education and focus. And so for me, I think that dedication and hard work, which ultimately I think is important from an entrepreneurial perspective, is ingrained in the example that my parents created for us as a family, but I think in the same vein, also thinking through the role of education. And I think importantly, the role of education to transcend one's economic circumstance. Um, it's one thing which my great late granddad used to always emphasize was just, he would spend any amount of money on education. So all these kids were educated, just some of them took their work more seriously and, and, and did better than others. And so think about the role that played in my family to get to where we are today as, as a family, but more importantly, the grounding I got um, also then informed what we, why I'm passionate about education and what we do at Go One. But I think to your question, um, I feel like my dad, my late dad was a bit of an entrepreneur. Um, and so he was a medical doctor, but he always had phenomenal ideas and he invested in businesses. And yeah, at some point we owned a nightclub in Hill Brown, then a butchery, then this and that, all while like still being like a doctor with like three doctorates. Like he was a very focused man. Um, and so from that perspective, just, like learning from his hard work ethic, I think was also something which I took away, um, which which I he passed away when I was eight, eight years old. But I think just the memory of him and the work he did, and look, my mother's a force of nature as well. Um, but I think it's just that importance of hard work. And I think for me, that really speaks to what it takes to be an entrepreneur and build a business. So call it nature versus nature if you want to weigh in on that debate. I like that. So so we know that you're an, you're an, um, an Alan Gray fellow yourself. Let's kick off by maybe you talking about what does that mean for you? It means the world to me, Darren. Um, and I think it's just because one thing I love about the Alan Gray community is just it's such a wholesome community. And I think, you know, some of my best friends are Alan Gray fellows. And it's just because of the richness of the bonds that we're able to build through the common experience, through the foundation itself. But I also think more importantly, um, just the shared vision to have an impact beyond what has been invested in us um, through the foundation, through life and through everything else. And so that's something which I, you know, I think one can take for granted when one's at the core face of back in the day, just as a context, I think for Alan Gray, we used to spend every Saturday going through like extra classes or lessons. I think that's the case today. And so when you had a late Friday night studying or otherwise, and you wake up early on Saturday morning to, to, to go and sit with folks and talk about life, it wasn't the best experience for guys to remember that, but I think just the crucible and how that essentially built the quality of relationships and my first business partners with Alan Gray Fellows. And so the community today, as it was, you know, over 10 years ago, is still very dear to, to me and my development as an entrepreneur. Mm. Okay, let's get into the discussion about Go One. <laughs> and so um, we obviously understand that this journey was birthed. I, I think somewhere I read it said a garage and another place it said a dormitory. But tell us where it all began. Tell us about, um, I know you started it with some friends. Tell us how this all started. How did Go One start? Yeah, so, you know, it's funny, right? Because ultimately the Go One founding story is a function of the different experiences of the, of the founding team. Um, and so all of us, ultimately converged in terms of, you know, building out Go One, but I think my, my journey, and I'll share the journey of some of my co-founders as well, was more from twofold. So one was um, as, a, as a student, met Alan Gray, I think it was in second year, and, real, and thought that finance one wasn't doing enough in terms of getting us towards being investors like Alan Gray, and so a few friends of mine and some fellows as well began an investment management company. And it was interesting, we did, we did, we did value investing, Warren Buffett, Full Fisher, Alan Gray, we spent Friday nights in the library actually debating stocks and having investment committee meetings. We took ourselves very seriously because then a couple of thousand rand we were working with was our life savings. 
And so in that process, and I think ultimately we did fairly well, beat the market for a good number of years. And then when unfortunately some of the guys began working, we couldn't trade stocks anymore because of compliance. And so we began to invest in unlisted businesses and like and private equity so did some stuff in Nigeria, Mozambique, and invest in some business in South Africa. Made a, I guess our first venture investment um, as in, in that in our investment vehicle was actually another fellow business called Yoko. Um, who invested in probably the pre-seed round then. And was interesting speaking to you know some of the team back then, um, like Carl and some of the guys around, like what are their pain points? And it was one thing around like you know finding the right people and not having people who have the right skill level. And if you ask them like, why don't you just like, you know, train your staff and do that kind of stuff. Back then they were a very small enterprise. It was like saying, no, they'll learn on the job. And you know, they thought it was like big businesses could afford to have formal training programs. Yet following that, I then um, did a few stint in banking in London and then joined a management consulting firm in South Africa, but worked in a few countries across the continent and into Europe, where you realize that many of the problems were brought on to solve as a consulting firm, often at high expense to be fair, were often a result of organizations not investing in their staff. Like if they'd invest in their staff adequately, they wouldn't need to charge or have consultants as much as they did. And so the reality was you had instances where the small guys said they couldn't afford it, but the big guys, all the money weren't getting it right. Um, and so for me, there lay, lay the problem. And so when I then got the scholarship to the UK, um, I then did uh, my second master's in education learning and technology, trying to unpack that 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 seemed that thing that seemed off. Um, and so that's where I met um, Andrew, um, who's one of my co-founders in the business. He was also a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford, but his segue into it was, was very different where, so he was dating a teacher at the time, now his wife, the man followed through, but just, and, and he had a website development company with a few of his high school friends. And so they were building websites, custom websites for people. And so after much conversations and thrashing, I convinced them that, look, we should sell that business and actually start um, what I guess is go one today because the reality is that it's a basic thing where, you know, if you're building a custom software business, you're going literally from project to project, whereas if you can actually build a focused product and actually focus your efforts on solving a problem, you can build something more scalable. And so at the time we we're both doing our masters in education learning technology, and we both, um, or oh, actually all of us in the founding team had ideas around the e-learning space. Um, and so from that perspective, we then decided to, to come together and incorporate and form what is going on today. That was in 2014, 2015. Um, and it was almost through that. But I think, you know, to the context of this conversation, our North Star's always been the same, even though we saw the problem differently. I mean, when we began the business, um, so they were starting to see some learning needs in their, in their software development business, and I'd come from the other side of things, and we were like, look, right now all the tools that exist on the market um, are very clunky and messy. And our principle back then was, you shouldn't have to learn how to learn, because if all the current tools on the market, you have to learn them just to get access learning. And so the key press for us was putting that customer first in the journey. And it was through that that we were able to then, I guess, rally behind and 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 kick off and kick off go and kick off go one um, in earnest in, 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 in that time period. So besides yourself and Andrew, are any of your the other friends or any of the other still active partners in the business? Hundred oh, percent. I mean, like Chris, Chris, they're like, I mean, you know, like it's or well, all of it together. I mean, and look so. Of the founding team, um, the other four from Australia, because um, that's where Andrew is originally from. Um, and so, look, all of us are still fairly active in the business. I mean, look, we all played different roles over a period of time. I mean, when we began the business, um, for example, I headed up all our go-to-market revenue sales. I built up our partnership platform. Um, I don't know, the go on marketplace is one which I built out. Andrew was more product. So it's been like, we all played different roles as the business has rolled. Um, so at the outset, um, Andrew was product manager, I was head of sales, Chris was head of customer success. Vu was busy finishing his medical degree. So we gave him a, a, gave him a few months, like a year to just finish that off. Because essentially, Andrew's an economist, PhD. Um, I'm an actuary. Vu is a medical doctor. Chris Aglin is a, is, a, is a lawyer. And Chris Hood, the only person who really has tech skills, okay, shame, other guys have tech skills, is actually a software engineer. And so it's quite the diversity of people. And so all of us play complementary roles in the business. Nice one. So, so, so Marvin, you earlier on you mentioned about this this North Star. You talk about vision quite a lot, and I, I know that um, one of the, the statements that you make is we exist to unlock positive potential in people through a love for learning. And so that then brings up the question: Did the team chase the bag, or did the bag come while you were chasing the vision? Well, 
I don't think it's mutually exclusive because if your vision is to, let's say, your vision is to, I don't know, world dominate, same thing we do every night, whatever it is, and try to take over the world. The reality is if you aren't able to fund the revolution, the revolution won't happen. And so I think chasing the bag, it goes part and parcel with the vision um, in terms of what we, what we do as an organization. I think what we were early on, we were very intentional about trying to be smart in how we built the business um, in terms of like measure our cash flows and trying to do certain things up front. I mean, look, everyone was 30 days with smashing our credit cards and managing stuff before we raised capital into the business. But I don't think it was either or, and I think it was our vision. It's actually probably been our vision that one has enabled us to remain a viable company and two, to scale to where we've scaled. Only because if we didn't have an aligned vision as an organization, Look, there are days when, you know, when I'm up and Andrew's down or Chris is up and whatever, like it's, 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 always, it's always like we balance each other out. If it wasn't for the common vision, you probably wouldn't even been able as a team to stay together to create the value from a money perspective. But also, I would actually argue it was us staying true to our vision that ultimately enabled us to scale the way we've scaled. And I'll just give you the high level context for that particular comment, where when we began Go One, our solution was a learning management system, which for people essentially is like a bookshelf. It's a show where someone can upload videos, PDFs, whatever it is, their own documents and PDFs and videos and deliver that to people and the platform tracks it. And look, we won the award for the best new platform in the world in 2015, 2014, like we did there, but that's a very crowded market and it didn't give us the kind of skill we needed. And the key insight for me was when I was setting up sales was just realizing that many of our clients weren't necessarily coming to us just about platform. They're coming to us for something more than that. And we realized that in our vision, it was about, our vision was not to build the world's best LMS um, or to like give clients LMS revision. It was about saying, how do we make richer, brighter learning for our, for, 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 for our customers? Um, just because our, I say brighter learning, because that was our initial slogan, because our initial company name was Aduro, which means spark in Latin. And we thought that was very smart and like it didn't scale though and so quickly didn't survive the first two years of our journey but i think for us in focusing on the actual vision of the business we're able to can you still hear me darren yeah okay awesome um so you, you'd be frozen there for a bit um and so in pursuing our vision we were able to then actually build out our content hub or content platform which is the biggest part of our business today by virtue of understanding what our actual customer needs and how's aligned to our vision and in doing so being able to make sure that we focus our efforts on building a product that actually solves a client need and helps us better address our vision, which I would argue that if our vision was just to make money, we would have never have actually thought through the implications of what we're building because we're still making sales. Mm. So, so let's talk a little bit about now the, the fundraising part of it, right? The fundraising journey, connecting with investors who share your vision. Does one ever have to modify the vision um, to to adapt the investor expectations or are you still able to stay true to that initial vision of why you you started this thing yeah i mean like look if you have to adjust your vision for an investor you don't need that investor in your business so from that perspective it's like um yeah they do that <laughs> it's a very slippery slope um but um in terms of um i guess more broadly thinking through you know fundraising and engaging let's say you know investors it has been a function of understanding but ultimately an investor relationship like any relationship right you need to not only understand yourself but understand them and what their needs are and how you match those what you're trying to achieve and so from that perspective for us it was always about being intentional of being very clear of the kind of investor we wanted before we even start to look for investors and in doing so we already knew what we were solving for and hopefully looking to find that in an investor and so it was once they entered to the vision because I mean, the vision was, is our glue in an organization. Yes, we have an awesome culture and all that good stuff, but our North Stars are North Stars. If we lose our way, we know we need to come back. And by no means in our internal conversations when we're thinking through where next to invest capital or not, it, it's, it's very easy, especially even now, to be like, okay, well, you know, we've got a little $250 million in the bank. Let's go and, 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 and start spending it on some silly things. The question is more so what does that mean in terms of alignment for the vision? And so I think that's a percent, regardless of how much money someone's offering you to stay true to. Mm. Okay. What would you say are some of the founding values that have remained consistent, even though you've had to partner, even though you've had to bring in investors? What are some of the founding values that have remained consistent? And how does that inform your hiring decisions when you start growing your team? 
Yeah, and look, so look, our values have been refined over a period of time, but I think the principles to your point have remained the same throughout. I think one was, you know, importantly for us being one team, because very early on we were a remote team. I mean, I early on the, the HQ of the business could have been anywhere because all of us were on planes all the time running around to different countries trying to do things. And so operating as one team was a big thing for us. And you know that the power and collaboration has been a big one. I think in the same vein, it's about, you know, one's attitude. And so for us, one of the things is about being a lifelong learner. Um, yes, we're a learning company, but also, you know, being open to, to know that you may not know everything, you know, and to make sure that we're open to learning. I mean, something I always tell my managers that report into me is that like, look, you know, you can't expect our business to grow exponentially if you yourself aren't growing, you know, at that same rate. And so how are you continue investing in yourself? And so we're very big on investing in our people's learning and development on that particular journey. I think, you know, open about that, you know, you know, um, you know, all the small things is a big one for us. And that's, yeah, I think that we came through from a Blink-182 song, but nevertheless, I think it got better scale now. We have just the importance of, you know, paying attention to detail, but also not necessarily triaging our customers just because someone is smaller than the next customer, treating them any differently and that level of equality. Um, and the final one really is creativity in Canada, which is one which we, which we borrowed fairly early on from Phil Katmal. So Phil Katmal was one of the executives at Pixar and it's a really great book called Creativity Inc. And just thinking through the process they follow at Pixar in terms of, you know, being able to come out to find Nemo and all those good places. And so I think just that importance of, you know, we can have the most robust conversations as a team, but ultimately, you know, we should feel free not to be creative, but we also need to be, have, have candor and how we deliver and give feedback and so forth. And so it's been a blend of those together with our culture that I think has enabled us to, I think internally find, uh, find the right talent to track the right talent because I think in hiring for us you you know you never want to be afraid to hire smarter people I mean the sad thing is because we've never hired over 300 people in the last since we started that like almost like 290 people in the business are smarter than I am but it does mean that you know we have raised the bar in terms of what the organization can do and ultimately they're still being able to achieve and so in hiring it was about thinking through you know cultural alignment and one's ability to grow and less around one's, you know, qualifications or the experience. I mean, some of our top employees, highest paid employees in the business are people who don't necessarily have university degrees. Um, I mean, like my, my, my head of South Africa, um, phenomenal lady who and trend us necessarily have university degree and we're currently paying that for her. But I mean, probably like one of the fastest learners I've come across in my time building businesses. And so it's something which, I think it's easy to focus on the wrong things because in certain ecosystems they'll say like, look, go get an MBA, go do this, go do that. But I think it sometimes comes down to attitude and temperament and obviously you know, aptitude in terms of one's ability to learn. But I think that's that resilience, grit and willingness to be a lifelong learner is so important for us when we think through stuff beyond just the cultural elements of, let's say, hiring someone. And I think we look for the same thing in our partners. And I think that's so important. I mean, something which, you know, in one of our rounds, so one of our investors is Microsoft. Um, and so as a part of that process, you know, going back and forth, we should take the money or not, or whatever it was, we, were, we connected with um, Reid Hoffman. He's the founder of uh, LinkedIn, or co-founder of LinkedIn and a partner at Greylock. And so he sits on the board of Microsoft. And I mean, like, you know, again, something I was asking is like, look, how do you choose to invest in companies out of his personal capacity? And one of the things which, you know, he was a fairly early investor, um, in, in, in Airbnb and just understanding what's the right thing for Brian Chesky and the guys was literally, you know, this is the kind of person that you want to, if you're stuck at an airport with, you know, be able to, 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 to spend those hours with other good people. But also importantly, if they're quite late at night, are they of the temperament and character that you take their call? And I think it's stuff which you can't necessarily see in a, call it in a CV and it's something which has evolved over the process. And mm -hmm. so that's how we, we get around that. How big is your team now? So we're just now under 250, 350. Wow, wow. All right, so if you have any questions for, for Malvin and you're on the webinar right now, please feel free to type them in the chat. We will open up for Q&A shortly with him. We're going to get to it in a moment. But I want to get through a couple more questions quickly about the discussion. I do know that there is another poll as well that Audrey would like to run. So Audrey, please feel free to put the poll up um, at any point. And then guys, if you would just complete the poll as soon as it pops up on your screen, answer the question and click submit. Let's get into um, how do you... Uh, what are some key lessons that you could give us today, today when it comes to building and growing a business that is globally relevant and competitive? Ooh, could you repeat the question again? Just the latter half, just if I start answering my own, my own question there. 
<laughs> sure thing. So the question is, how do you build and grow a business that is globally relevant and competitive? Yeah, I knew the idea that I need to make sure that globally relevant is a key one because you can build a global business. The question is, is it globally relevant? I think that's a different question altogether. So the devil's in the detail there. And I mean, like, look, there are many lessons that one can glean. I mean, look, it's still very early in our journey. So by my own means, but I'm just sharing based on our experience building out Grow One. But I think it's ultimately keep, I, you know, and I say this in many kinds, but keeping the main thing the main thing. I think if you focus on your customer and let that guide you as opposed to the ego of raising a fundraising round or building a another application or whatever it is, you will probably be able to reach a better pace. And I think for us, you know, we've entered, so we service clients, we have teams in nine countries now, service clients in probably 28. And the reality is that you, you can't have the arrogance of saying, just because I win in Australia, I'm going to go win in New Zealand. Or because I'm winning in South Africa, I'm going to go win in Nigeria. And I think it's the importance of like, really paying attention to the customers that you're serving in those markets and listen. And so for us, we're very humble in terms of the importance of partnership. And just thinking through how we enter markets, how we hire people um, in, in the businesses that we have. Um, and so from that perspective, I just saw on the poll here, I consider myself to be an entrepreneurship cheerleader and supporter is the best response I can give um, <laughs> in that particular way. But um, I think for us, it's been that. I think one, you know, keeping the main, the main thing, staying close to our customers, understanding them, having the humility to partner. For us, um, partnership is a very big thing. And I think for me in my life, something I've been very fortunate to have in all my contexts. I mean, whether that was, I don't know, in my perfect body when I was head boy in high school or like even like SLC or when I was at Oxford and that kind of stuff. Literally just having the power of teams and playing people's strengths is so important. I think it's very easy, you know, to say like, you know, you know, we're big, we've got the money, the capital, which fine, maybe we have now. But I mean, even in our early days where you are looking to partner to enter new markets, I think for us, I'm very big on paying school fees. And learning lessons, but I want to make new mistakes. And so I want to learn from other people's experiences. And so it's very intentional about listening, learning, consulting, and not thinking from a level of hubris that you all of a sudden understand all the dynamics in an ecosystem or market. And I think that's really helped us build the business. But ultimately, the core engine of our growth, hands down, is our people. I mean, if like I exist and my focal point exists to enable our people to exceed and excel. And so from that perspective, that's where I, I bias my efforts and time. Um, particularly because um, I look, businesses, people make our business. And so I think for us, we can earn a our people. And so I think investing in our people has enabled us to both scale globally, but more importantly, remain competitive. Um, because, you know, as Adam Smith would say, you know, it's those people that are working at the cold face of the machine line that are able to come up with the most innovations. And ultimately, it's our people that are engaging with our customers, our clients, our partners. We can't get to everybody. And so enabling them to bring the ideas, to let them grow and scale and actually reach their full potential has enabled us as a business to continue to grow and scale. Mm. Thank you so much for that one. All right, um, let's give it about 30 seconds. And so guys, if you would please complete the poll, there is a poll up on your screen right now. Um, and if you quickly answer the poll and then we'll continue the discussion. Another reminder, if you do have a question for Melvin, we're gonna get to questions shortly. Um, I'll ask you to raise your hand and then switch your camera and uh, microphone on. But for now, there is a poll up on screen. I can see that. Um, nobody's voted yet. So <laughs> if you would quickly, guys, uh, just complete the poll that's up on your screen. There are, you just need to choose the answer that applies to you best. Darren, it's Eunice here. It says the poll is closed when I try to vote. Audrey, maybe we can get it to you to put it up again. So I'm going to end it and then I'll ask you to just put it up again. Audrey. So there we go. Polls back up, so if everybody could quickly vote. There we go. <laughs> now something's happening. Thanks, Eunice. <clears throat> All right, and so, so Malvin, the next question that I want to ask is, so in many ways, um, serving international clients is a dream of many startups. Um, and so is that an, a realistic aspiration or is that only for the Malvins of this world? <laughs> no, it's a realistic aspiration for everybody. I think the reality is, I think we live in a global world where, you know, problems aren't in isolation. Something I appreciate about entrepreneurship is even when it comes to building a business, the challenges you face as co-founders, entrepreneurs, <clears throat> aren't unique to our geography, we find ourselves. Um, I think, yes, you have someone in Yugoslavia is better phrase. I mean, I was speaking to a gentleman this morning who is looking at taking on some investment and like he has like 
So Romanian based and has, he teaches about 80 million people a year how to like learn different languages. And I was like, one of the languages he has is Afrikaans. And I was like, you're chilling in Romania. How are you like teaching guys to like learn Afrikaans? And, and like, look, you'll never know from the storefront of the business that's Romanian based, but they do phenomenally well. And they're one of the top three education learning companies in the world for learning languages. But it's interesting where it's a global village. And so I think for me, and something of insight I only fully appreciated, you know, just reflecting on our, even our last round and our growth is ultimately the size of the business you can build is only constrained by the size of the problem you're solving. And so if you're solving a globally relevant problem to your point you mentioned earlier, I think the sky's the limit. I think that's a function of execution. Um, and I think it comes down to one's ambition. And ultimately for me, the learning is, I mean, I think about the early days when, you know, Tuck Shop was selling stuff there and like in the early days in, 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 in corporate where, you know, whether you're building a big business or a small business, it takes the same amount of effort. You can have the same sleepless nights, you can have the same issues. Like you might as well give it horns and go big. Um, and so I'm a firm believer, and if you can go big, go big. Um, and I think that's where I think it's not necessarily limited to the few to dream big, but also do big. Yeah. What would you say? What would you say is your fastest growing market? And then how competitive is the space? And what would you believe is your competitive advantage based on where you're at right now? So again, yeah, so the fastest growing market right now has to be the Middle East in the last financial year. Um, well, actually, it's the Middle East and Africa, but I mean, like, the key growth came out of a bit north of Africa, but Middle East as well. But also, it's tough because the base is lower, right? And so, it's also it's easy to, to say that from a growth perspective. That being said, um, in the last, yeah, 24 months, I mean, we opened up in the U.S. probably, like, probably two and a half years ago, a few years ago. And I mean, the U.S. has been a phenomenally growth market um, for that, um, from, from that perspective, just because for us, it was low base high growth. So, it's an easy arbitrage there. But I think we just see in the Middle East... Um, the rest of Africa, just an interesting appetite for people to learn more. And I think particularly during this time um, of, of COVID and so greater investments taking place in that space. Um, but yeah, I'd say, look, our biggest markets would probably be, yeah, probably the US, US first and Australia, maybe then the UK, then Singapore, Malaysia, and then and, and in South Africa and, and the rest of the continent. <laughs> I'm laughing at Eunice's comment in the chat. She's saying, loving the questions, Darren. I'm not going to have any questions left. <laughs> so I'm being the voice of the people. But guys, I promise you, <laughs> I feel like we are still... Vote Darren for change. <laughs> so, so, so one of the next questions is, what next? So what opportunities come with, with achieving unicorn status? But I think before we even get to that, explain to us exactly what that means. So here we see you are now valued at... Um, over 1 billion US dollars. What does that mean for a company that started in a dormitory with, with a group of friends? And what opportunities comes with that? Yeah, I think one, it's, 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 it's very humbling because I mean, like for us, it's really like, and to the point I think you mentioned earlier, just a validation of the work you've been doing because the reality is, you know, fundraising rounds put valuations on the business. Before the fundraising round, our business wasn't any different to what it is um, at the time. And I think it's, it's good to see that there's value in what you built. And I think that's more important. But I think also what it means for us as a business now is that it does enable us more capital or firepower to deepen our vision and our mission. I mean, ultimately, we want to reach a billion learners. And, you know, that's something which we want to achieve. And the reality is, you know, right now we reach just under 5 million users. And so from that perspective, the reality is you've got a long way to go to get to 5 billion or to get to 1 billion. And so from that perspective, it really is day one. And that's what we say internally, because yes, we raise the capital, but really this is the beginning because the space we're in is a hundreds of billion dollar industry. And so it really is about just executing and continuing to keep the head down. So I think it is both humbling, but I think also puts focus in terms of the impact and the, and, and, and the significance of what we can do yeah, from a learning perspective. And so definitely... It, 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 it does keep us grounded. Nice one. Okay, Melvin, I think let's pause here for a moment and I'm going to open the floor and get a couple of questions. And so uh, first one, Elijah. So Elijah, if you could unmute yourself, put your video on and you get to ask the first question. Cool. Thanks a lot for the session. Um, just wanted to find out uh, in the beginning stages you were B2B. How did your sales funnel look like from a B2B perspective? How, how did you guys go about getting your first clients and really poaching them and pitching to them to get that first client to get that snowball and flywheel effect? Yeah, it's an interesting question, only because your first clients are never really a good marker. And so one of the biggest challenges, so we did this program um, called Y Combinator in 2015. Actually, I remember I said Aisha's on the call. Aisha, I think at the time, was also 
are doing a very this incubator that we were in Silicon Valley at the time. And the biggest challenge I had was, if I had to ask our first then, I think it was seven customers, why they were buying Go One or why they bought Go One, all of them had a different reason. And that just spoke to the way in which we acquired them and to your question, right? Because early on, you are reaching through, um, you know, reaching out through networks. You are trying to see the RFPs out there. You're trying to like see who you know in your network, who is an HR person. So it really is just that, right? And I think we went even that methodical um, in, in, in achieving that. And yes, you know, we find you won an early quick win where we're doing some really nice stuff with the, with the Malaysian government through our RFP. Um, but I think, again, it was really for different purposes. And I think for us, what allowed us to actually like scale the funnel properly was understanding our value proposition. Because same way, I think to Darren's question, you know, when you're speaking to a customer or speaking to a potential investor, are you changing your message for each particular customer? Yes, you will, but you're even not like, I don't know, resonates with a telecom versus a Anglo versus a mom and pop store. You'll fall on deaf ears. And so for us early on building that funnel was really a function of understanding and actually doing post analysis in some of the early clients. And something which I think we could have done better at early on, to be fair, was actually spending more time speaking to potential clients to get them to almost pseudo buy into our platform before we built it. So if I know I'm sending to finances, but I'm sending to CFOs, and look, there are enough guys in banks and whatever, and like CEAs and stuff in our ecosystem, to reach out to them and be like, hey, I'm building this platform. Can you give me advice? What do you think? And almost get them to be your early, let's call them product advisors, but in the same vein, your early customers, because that's an easier way to convert. So I do that differently going back. But I think then just to cap out the question, I mean, our, our funnel, as it began to mature, it was then a blend of different things. I mean, there's a, there's a book which I spent many a night devouring um, called, um, uh, what was it called? Predictable Revenue, I think it was called at the time. And yeah, really good B2B SaaS focused book. I mean, look, we ended up like doing a blend of what they did in that book because it didn't make sense in most of our markets. But I think just having structure to your sales funnel goes a long way. Elijah, is that? Awesome stuff. Um, you'll notice, guys, that if you don't have a bookshelf behind you, you're not allowed to be on video tonight. <laughs> I'm kidding. So let's see. Uh, we'd like to go with the next question. If you just uh, raise your hand, uh, I'll then call your name. You can then just put your video on and ask your question for Melvin. I know Eunice, did you have a question? I'm trying to think of a question in a panic. <laughs> Anyone answer the question in the meantime while Eunice is trying to think of a question in a panic? Otherwise, I think I'm going I'm to go through another one that I wanted to ask you. And I think the question was balancing impact and profit. What would you say comes first? And I don't think it's either or. And I'll tell you why. So my career goal, like, and my professional career goal is to create 100,000 jobs. Like, that, that's what I'm here for. And I, you know, I thought 100,000 was a fairly like robust target until um, one day I was having a discussion with Brian Joffe, the founder of Bitvest. And he was like, with well, Melvin, I've created 180,000 jobs in Bitvest. I'm starting long for life now. So, like, you need to do better. And I was like, okay, touche. But I think for me, the principle was that if you have an outsized impact, it's very rare that you're going to end up being a poor person. I don't know persons that create 100,000 jobs and actually been poor. And so, for us, I think even though like, look, we're in a team of 300, you know, 350, I mean, the number of, you know, smaller content providers and content authors and stuff that we support our ecosystem. I mean, we, most of our revenue, we pay away to our content providers and earn any content ourselves. And so it's almost by, by doing that that we're able to have an impact. That being said, we are a business. Um, and as a shareholder, I'm very much about the return on capital to shareholders and we're very particular when you think about, to I think even Elijah's question, thinking through where we invest next or from a sales funnel, how do we think through different places? Do we spend more on digital marketing versus getting an SDR versus whatever? The reality is that is a financial decision and that is almost thinking through the call it monetary side of things because you want the highest return on the capital invested. And so I think it's, 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 always, it's always a consideration. I just feel like you will probably not build a very valuable or very good company or exciting company to work for if you overly focus on making money. Um, and I think for us, we've been able to attract the talent we've been able to attract, and even the investment we've been able to attract in our business because of the of the the values, the mission, the vision, and ultimately the impact we try to achieve as a team. Um, and so I think they go hand in hand. But I, uh, to be remiss of me to realize that or to say that there's no 
value in focusing on the actual economics of it all. So either you're leaving everybody speechless or I'm doing a real job, good job of asking all the right questions that's on everybody's mind. Um, so so if I, heard, I, heard, I heard that Katek was buying us all cake. Maybe she wants to like tell us about how, uh, what's going on down there because I'm keen to, to have cake as well. Um, some of our bodies can be lost, it's fine. I mean, I will buy cake for everybody who wished me happy birthday. Cool, touche. <laughs> Happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's too late, Darren. It's too late. You had the whole of October. And now it's over. <laughs> excuse, excuse. Uh, Eunice, you can put your, your video on and you can ask your question. I feel like I'm under immense pressure to ask a question now. Um, Melvin, maybe something, it could be lighter, it could be heavier, but what are some of the biggest bloopers that thinking back you still cringe and would do differently if you could go back? on the journey biggest bloopers so very early on we something which i always think about is like could i could I have gotten could we have gotten go on to where it is today spending less money right like in, like in terms of the journey and the answer is probably yes because the school is paid on the journey i mean i think about personal bloopers this is again the benefit of having co-founders because there's sometimes it was just ungovernable in, in, in what i was pushing through the organization and it kept me honest um I think the biggest bloopers have often been the kind of partnerships we structured. And so, look, a big part of our sales is these days is, you know, working to our partners and we reach, you know, well beyond our sales force through our partners. And just early on, I think it wasn't appreciating how important you are to a partner, you know. So, you know, there was a, we're looking at a partnership in India at the time. And I mean, these guys were selling all the dreams to us. And I just, because I was like, oh man, someone cared enough to reach out to us to want a partner. I just didn't ask enough questions and apply enough diligence and thinking around like investing the time and also the ultimately the team's resources in that relationship, which actually went patient. And I think that at some point they tried to like steal our IP. But it was one of those things where if I had just not been in so awed that, oh no, someone actually cared enough to reach out to us to want a partner, as opposed to actually like, you know, think diligently through it. I think that would have that would have that that that, that people wouldn't have happened, and yes, in the end, we find they didn't take our IP and all that good stuff. But I think the pain of that process again wasn't necessarily necessary um, in our journey, and so I think it's just more that point of discernment because the reality is this, right? In any partnership, and I remember once, um, and must have been as a DCT, I went to this thing. We did this internship program in the US, and we met the founder of a company called Blackboard. So Blackboard is like a listed learning platform in the US, which is a big one. I remember this guy, I think his name's Michael, Michael Blackboard, I think it is actually, Michael something. And he used to go around early days and say, you know, he has a partnership with Microsoft. And what he let us know was that all he had was office licenses and that was his partnership with Microsoft. And so I think just as a point of learning was in thinking through partnerships, someone can either be partner with you and give you money from, you know, CSI, they can give you money from their OPEX or they can give you money from their OPEX or their CAPEX, I mean, and depending on what, how important you are to them, the money will come from different spaces and it's important to interrogate just the equal value in that relationship, which I didn't do at the time. Elijah, let's go to your question. Well, uh, just got, I was listening to your podcast this week a while back and I recall that you were always reiterating reflections a lot. How do you go about your reflections and yeah, why do you do them and how do you do them? So I, see, I'm told if I should, I don't know if you know, I, I used to be a big reflector in the shower as a side note, um, just because it was like my, my peaceful time. I used to enjoy that until I lived in Cape Town and then there was a water crisis and then it wasn't an option. And so I then took up running. Um, and so from that perspective, I, like, I, I tried to run now and then I think that's my quiet time like being in the outdoors. And I think for me, when I think about the reflection process, I mean, you know, something which all the real Gs in the game, whether that's like um, Adrian Gore will tell you this, or you're speaking to Jeff Bezos, even like, you know, um, the team at Bridgewater, Ray Dalio will tell you just the importance of like mindfulness. And ultimately it's about each day making one or two good decisions. And I think it's about being able to take away that clutter. And so something I tried to do during lockdown was actually like, failed dismally was actually block out like time in my diary to actually do think work because you know you can go back to back teams and zooms and everything else and just to create that space where I can apply my best thinking. Um, and so I just want to make sure that I'm continually learning from my mistakes because 
you know, there are many things which I may have misstepped in my career and life, whatever it is, but the reality is if I had the same information and the same, let's say, processing power, as it were, in my brain, would I make the same decision? If the answer is yes, then I can't fault myself for the decision I've made. And so for me, reflection gives me the tools to think through how do I improve my decision making or my problem solving? And so I always try to hold myself to account and trying to be a better thinker and reflect in that way. Thank you. Next up, uh, I think we have Dennis Love. I hope I said your name correctly. Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Um, thanks so much, Melvin. It's, it's great to meet you. I'm a good friend of Tanashe, Dr. Tanashe. Oh, the man himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he said we should uh, definitely get in touch. But um, I wanted to ask, given that your operation is such an international global one, what are your thoughts on um, what was kind of the value you gained from going and studying abroad, building those kind of networks, given that obviously the resources in South Africa are a lot tighter than some other developed nations that have, you know, a wealth um, that they can invest in these kind of startups? What value do you find from going abroad um, generating networks, investments, and then bringing that back to South Africa. Is that, is that possible? What, what are your thoughts on, on that? Yeah, it's a good point. And, you know, it's actually, you know, the good man himself is probably one of the most qualified guys I know. Um, and so he's, he's racked up and he's been around the world. But the biggest learning, and I'll get to the other parts of the question, the biggest insight that benefit for me from actually being abroad and whether that's working, studying, or, or gallivanting, being ungovernable, was really just the appreciation that, we have really smart people in South Africa. Like having worked in whatever, over 40 countries and like high class and some of the top schools in the world and studied with some and all that stuff. Like we often, I think it's almost that, almost the variety of complex, or like the complex that one has where it's like, I haven't got a master, I haven't been abroad, I haven't, you know, worked in Wall Street and therefore the guy from Harvard, Princeton or whatever is better than me. But like, I, will, I, I you know, we had a meeting with the, at a meeting with the, with the president the other day, because so wants to do some stuff in the startup ecosystem. And I was making the point where like, literally our best exports are our people. Like, and so for me, it's an appreciation from being international just to realize how good the people are that we have in South Africa and just how good our education system is from even undergraduate perspective. And so that for me was a big insight because it also gave me more confidence to be like, but no, I, I'm meant to be in this room. Like, cause yes, you all go through your challenges. I remember when we were entering the US early on, I mean, I was there with my tweed jacket coming out of Oxford as a young African guy. And I mean, it was hard making sales. Guys would be like, they'd, your accent was funny. They'd be like, who's this random black guy? Because racism was real at the time, but he still is. And, you know, I actually literally had to hire like an old white male as my first sales hire to like get some clients over the line. Even though he was reporting to me, it was irrelevant. And so those are nuances you can't discount in the world. And so I think the world can be good for exposure. But I think in the same vein, look, home ground advantage goes a long way. But I think in terms of the internationalization of the business, what being in a diverse setting has helped me is to better understand people in different organizations and different parts of the world. Because the reality is people buy from people, people invest in people, people work for people, right? Because ultimately, regardless of what your business is, whatever you're selling, it is people to people. And so I think in my experience at Oxford, where my first master's, there were 64 of us in the class and about 34 nationalities. And literally, like, just that diversity. And my gym buddy back then was the deputy minister of mining and minerals of Afghanistan. Just that diversity for me was phenomenal in terms of thinking through a different value system, which I think is the true benefit from that. And ultimately, yes, there may be some networks that come from that. But for me, those are probably secondary to the actual understanding people. Thanks so much. That was an awesome answer. Thanks, Marvin. Thanks for your question, Dennis Love. Uh, is there anyone else with a question for Malvin? Are you having fun, Melvin? Are you enjoying this conversation? I actually am, but there are some people in this call I'm seeing pop up who I'm long overdue to catch up with. I need to be better um, in this life. And so that's one thing, but also enjoying the conversation. You know, it's been awesome since I've actually chatted to the community. Awesome. Um, Dennis Love, do you have another question? Go for it. <laughs> I do. I, I do. I'm back. Um, my question then, I guess, is um, so a few people on this, this chat now obviously have small businesses uh, and they're either preparing or in the process of getting investment. So when would you kind of say is the best time to look for investment? Should you be looking for investment? What are the indicators that you should be looking for kind of partners to come on board? Yeah. And I think from that perspective, it is the point around alignment, I think is so important. Um, so as the investors as any sort of relationship, the problem with investors is they don't like employees or like partners that you can't just like kick them to touch if you don't want them there. And I think it's about 
really then being discerning in who you bring on board in your cap table. Um, and I think for us, it was around doing our research on the investors and understanding exactly, because the, the funny thing is early on, it's phenomenal. You know, Andrew and I referred to us the other day where early on you speak to a hundred guys to get like, to get like two investors. It was crazy. Like, and I thought like, you know, we're two smart dudes, road scholars coming out of Oxford. By the time we took our first capital, we probably had like, like at least like a million dollars worth of rev. Like we were like, we were like, we were thought we were crushing it, but still the difficulty of, and I thought like, you know, I thought I was well loved. I was like, I'm coming back as a good child. Guys were like, oh yeah, mom, we like you, but you're for somebody else to come into the round. And so you can't discount how difficult it is to raise, especially early on. I mean, look, yes, as you get like larger, it's different. I mean, like, you know, now it's like, maybe you speak to whatever. You, you're looking for two investors to get a hundred and your rounds are oversubscribed and all that kind of stuff. But I think the key thing for us was really just being intentional about who we approached. And that came from a deep understanding of, I'm looking at particular, um, they say I'm a B2B fashion company. I would, someone who's invested in, in, in B2B, okay, not B2B, let's say B2C fashion, that's more logical. B2B fashion is fairly difficult. Um, is if that was the case, looking for guys who invested in similar industries or who's in, who has a similar theme and you know, going on YouTube and seeing what they're talking about. Because even you just showing you've done your diligence on an investor goes a long way for them to have comfort that you actually are serious about your business and you're very intentional. So me being able to be like, oh, hey, you know, now graduate Microsoft, you mentioned this in your last talk to Satya, da, 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 da. it's something small like that just gives that level of nuance. And I think it's a personalized relationship that one builds after that. And so I think it's almost like doing the work up front that goes a long way. Thanks again. And I just want to add, I, I don't have a bookshelf in the background, but I have a bunch of 3D printers. So kind of fill the space. Thanks background. so much, Marvin. Thank you, scrutinizing your background there. Thanks for that one. Anyone else with a question or can I move on to a couple more that I've got? While we wait for the next question to come through. So, so the next question I wanted to chat about to you, Malvin, is the fact that obviously with the evolution of technology, um, it's enabled innovation and a surge in the field of education. How has COVID-19 or the COVID-19 pandemic accelerated growth in this area? And what does this mean for the digital divide in society? Has it become more obvious or are we managing to actually close this gap? Yeah, look, I think one thing which the pandemic sadly highlighted was just how big the divide was. I mean, like, so I serve on, of, uh, on the board of directors slash council of a, of a school in South Africa. And I mean, the private school fairly well off, but I mean, we were able to seamlessly go into digital learning and, you know, do things via Google Classroom and all this nice stuff. Whereas, you know, I advise some of the ministers locally and most of the schools that in our remit with the minister were like, they couldn't do anything. And so I think if anything, it, you, it was almost papered over the cracks in terms of just how bad that divide was. And I think if anything, COVID highlighted that. And I think it speaks to so much more than just having access to devices or having like infrastructure. And so that was a key one. But I think definitely, I think the pandemic has accelerated the adoption thereof because I think the reality is, guys seem to be like, yes, Marvin, I'm sure you're well placed. You know, you guys thought saw this thing coming. But the reality is early on, it was so difficult to convince a company to adopt a cloud-based learning platform they were like no it must be on-prem or we want to do face-to-face -face stuff this like yes the winds have changed and now like there's actually an intention in a way like it's preferred to be in the cloud it's good to have digital learning and virtual classes and so forth but it wasn't always the case i think we were fortunate to be well positioned at the time um to achieve that um as well so from that perspective we're very fortunate um but i think definitely the pandemic has accelerated growth in the space and we're fortunate to have grown significantly during the pandemic but i think it was because the foundations were laid beforehand in terms of thinking through what a future, I guess, future learning environment looks like. Mm. Any other questions? Do we have any other questions from anybody else? Yes, uh, Elijah, I see Elijah's got another one. Go for it, Elijah. Um, first one, um, what industry do you think the next African billion, the next African uh, unicorn will come from? And second one, I hope you haven't sold your Bitcoin yet. Um, so, I mean, I'd rather go along on like, ETH and some of the other the other tickers in the crypto space, but I mean BTC we can also play. Um, <laughs> but in the same vein, um, I would probably think that oh look the next one must also come from education. I think look there are probably less ed tech like unicorns than there are others. I mean the reality is I suspect the next unicorn will come from actually I know my mates. The next unicorn will come from fintech just because I know who's raising money right now. Um, but I think if you think beyond the common ones like fintech, because fintech is one of those ones where their scale and also the investment market's very thoughtful for them right now. I think if you had to ask me exactly where, like the next, if you ask me in the next 50 years, where the big, like the real money is gonna come from, 
it's going to be in like challenges. I think very bullish on the logistics space because something small like I don't know, like in Africa, you think about like it, like the cost of a final good in Africa on average, seventy five percent of that cost is due to logistics, whereas in Europe it's six percent. So there's lots of stuff to happen in that space. I think agri agri is a party. There's so much to be done there. I mean, it's crazy. Like yeah, agri also. But I think the one globally where if you really want to make money and 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 you you don't have to worry about your Bitcoin holdings is to clean tech. I think you know next thirty years, like they're going to be more they're going to be more Krotman billionaires coming out clean tech than 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 anything you've seen. And then speaking to some guys doing really cool stuff in that space, I think it's 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 a really exciting place to be. Thanks, Elijah. So. Um, we, we know obviously the Alan Gray ecosystem itself is quite globally diverse. What practical steps would you recommend for some of the fellows on the call tonight or even organizations such as the foundation or eSquared? What practical steps can they take to create more opportunities for the creation of more globally relevant South African businesses? And so you said the steps they can take from a foundation perspective or from fellow, fellow fellows in the ecosystem? I think, I think fellows more. Okay, fair enough. Let me not be that guy. Um, I think ultimately, it's interesting, right? I think one thing which is very easy, I think the fellow attracts some of the most high quality caliber people in South Africa, whether it's corporate entrepreneurship. I mean, like, like you know, before the call, guys were asking me, like, you know, Marvin, because I think everyone on the call at the time had a baby. I was just saying, you know, the amount of, you know, the ball I want to need to pay to, like, marry a fellow would be ridiculous because the investment in them and the caliber of people. And I think the counterfactual of that is that, you know, I think often as fellows, we don't do enough to support each other. And I think it's changed over time, but I think there's almost that level of competition that exists between us as opposed to collaboration. Um, and I think from that perspective, you know, we're fighting over who is the biggest sand castle as opposed to people around us building skyscrapers around the beach. And I think it's important for us to collaborate so we can build those skyscrapers. Um, and I think that's where we can help each other, whether that's through sharing the school fees that we've paid in our journey, whether it's investing in each other's businesses, whether it is advising people, connecting someone not in an unsolicited way, but maybe reaching out to someone, you know, to, to ask for assistance on something. Um, and I think from that perspective, that's how we can really help each other. But I think it's also important to not be afraid to celebrate your successes. I think something which I struggled with fairly early on in our journey was like, because look, we're still a startup. Yes, it's a very valuable startup and it's grown and scaled, but we're still a startup. And so it's almost that, you know, but who am I to be sharing learnings? Who am I to be sharing my journey and that kind of stuff? But I think there's so much one can glean from other people's journeys that I think can be shared in the broader community. And I think that's something which we can do better as fellows because all of us experience entrepreneurship differently. Um, and I think that's something which we can just as a community be better at. Nice one. All right, so um, I think Audrey, if you, if you don't mind putting up the, the last of the polls right now, so let's get the polls up. And then in a moment, we're gonna come back and we're gonna wrap up the discussion. But Audrey, you can put the polls up for now. Guys, if I could ask all to participate in the poll, if there is still anyone with a question, you're most welcome to just raise your hand. I will get you to ask your question as well. But for now, I know that Audrey had another couple of polls that we wanted to complete. Can we get that up? There we go. Questions up on your screen. Choose the correct answer and submit. Couple more need to complete it. I'll give it another 10 seconds. In the meantime, is there anyone else that has a question for Melvin? I am at least asking a question. Go for it. Hi, Melvin. Hey. Um, hope you're well. Yeah, I just wanted to ask something related, I think, to, I guess, the education space. Um, if you would say, when it comes to training and development of, you know, newly, I guess, graduates, 
entering the like the sort of the the workspace what would you say is the biggest challenge in terms of you know self learning and development for you know graduates entering like the new space so what is like the biggest challenge that they face um that you maybe might have come across because of um, engagements with, say, clients that you know want to train and develop um, their newly uh, graduate uh, students. Okay, no, it's so, a good question. No, it's a very question. Sorry? I think look, and it's, a, it's a good question. I think we work with a number of companies from South Africa and abroad on that like, grad programs and that kind of stuff. And I think, but interesting, I think what companies believe to be the what companies believe to be the missing pieces is often basic stuff like you know communication. Like, you know, like literally communicating, structuring arguments and writing a decent email without using an emoji or, or a shorthand laugh out loud is stuff you take for granted because it's fairly acceptable. But those are things that companies also focus on. I think the biggest one which people I think don't appreciate is importance of personal brand. I think, you know, it's something which we see a lot of training towards because, you know, you come into an organization, you're a grad, you think you're the smallest kind of totem pole, therefore the stuff you do won't necessarily be that meaningful. But depending on how you position your brand in the organization, it can either make or break you because that will see whether guys will invest in you or throw you to the wayside. And so I think just the importance of, and personal brand goes a long way in terms of how you carry yourself, the clothing you wear, all that stuff, which, you know, isn't necessarily the core of what we teach, but we have courses on that. And it's something which we see, you know, many of the big corporates being like, look, we can really just invest some time on that because if you take your brand seriously, you'll shop differently, you'll dress differently, you'll express yourself differently. And those are things that go a long way, which I think are taken for granted. I think on the other side, Something which I see from some of the sessions I've been in with some of the teams over the years is also a function of confidence. There's a lot of imposter syndrome that happens in companies where like, you know, you feel like you fluked your way to get hired at the company and now you've gotten this big job and you're like, okay, maybe they won't know that I don't know my stuff. It's okay not to know stuff. I think people are too scared to ask questions early on in their careers. And it's something I came to appreciate very early on in my corporate career is that no company can pay you enough not to ask the right questions and not to learn, you know? And I think for me, it's just about Again, I think often as graduates come to organizations, we don't ask the, the, the we aren't, we're afraid to almost ask questions because we're scared we're going to shop ourselves. We don't deserve to ask questions. I think that that, that needs to change. Okay. No, thank you. Thank you. That makes sense. Thanks for your question, Karabo. All right. Um, so as we wrap up the discussion, a couple of things, Melvin, I want to dive into with you. And this is more on a personal level. I think let's start, let's talk a little bit about just to, what drives you personally? What keeps you awake at night? Uh, <laughs> what would you believe is your biggest win? I know earlier on you said that you, your goal or your dream is to create 100,000 jobs. Um, what else? What else drives you? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And no, look, I think from that perspective, I think what, what keeps me up at night, I mean, is probably the team in Australia because that time zone is a wild one. But um, when I think through, I guess, the business, just thinking through like, you know, you know, I always say as a startup, when, when you're the startup being mentioned in someone else's deck as a, like a potential like, you know, company you want to emulate, you're probably going to the point where you need to start watching yourself because that means you know, guys are coming for you. And so it's just making sure that we continue to you know, focus on our customers and continue to add value and grow and scale as we go along and then become complacent. Um, and also making sure that we're making the right investments now for the future because the reality is, yes, investments today has gotten us to where we are today. And the organization's thinking through what is that next five, 10 years look like in the business. And so it's just being intentional about that. Nice one. Um, I'm sure you've had this question a hundred times, but I'm going to ask it again. So <laughs> what advice would you give to 15 year old Melvin? Sure. Now that you know better, now that you've walked the journey. Yeah, what is 15 year old Melvin even doing? I think that he was only like, what is 15 year old Melvin doing? He was in like grade nine doing subject choices, I'm sure. I mean, like, you know, to be fair, 15 year olds, I think it's a good timeline to go back to. I, you know, I would say, one, don't take yourself too seriously. Um, I think, you know, I think something, some people say I can be too serious at times. And I think I could have, I could have been less, less serious as a 15 year old. But then again, I can never observe the counterfactual of us as, as much of a joker now as I am now as I was then. Who knows? Maybe a different story we'd be having today. Um, but I think that's one thing as well. I think it's important to like, to trust the process. I think I found that now 50, I'm thinking about, you know, subject choices and like, you know, what my subject choices meant for when I was going to, what job am I going to get and what, like, overthinking things. I think it's just about, you know, importance of showing up every single day and just doing the best you can do in that day is more important than having a master plan. And so, you know, something which I have in a number of our boardrooms and toilets across some of our offices 
it's just a simple equation again going back to maths and i think it was it's one which i think one may be familiar with where it's like you know one point not not one to the power of three six five versus you know no point whatever you know nine 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 and and to the power of three six five and just realizing the outsized impact of doing something incrementally better every single day and what that means over a year period is phenomenal and so for me it's just the importance of showing up in each environment, in each instance, just trying to be each day marginally better, which ultimately has outsized impacts. I think that's where it comes down to like, not necessarily solving for, you know, world domination, but just showing up better every single day. Mm, nice one. All right, we're almost at the end of the discussion. And so I think I'm gonna allow just a couple of, maybe just in the chat guys, let us know what you've thought of the discussion tonight. Um, let's have some shout outs for Melvin. I think it's been absolutely great chatting to you. And so I think just as we as we wrap it up, Melvin, um, so my company is called Inspired. And so there's no way I'm going to let you go without giving us an inspirational quote that you live by. OK. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, give us your 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 personal inspirational quote that you live. By. Well, I wouldn't say like it's a quote um, per se from that perspective. I mean, like the few things that, you know, like that, like, you know, ultimately hit home for me. But I think for me, you know, as I guess, you know, someone, someone who I guess is a, is a strong Christian. Um, so from that perspective, I think it's, for me, it's just, you know, going back to, to the Bible and just really trying to, 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 to get it through. And so for me, like Romans 8 verse 28 is one that resonated with me in that particular way. I mean, you know, like, and essentially for those not familiar with it, essentially like, you know, you know, all things um, work out for good um, if they're done to the accordance of the Lord and his purpose and I think it's just having that true north of you know realizing even though you know there are things in the world that can be of the flesh just focusing on something higher than yourself and so for me that's my faith it's my family it's my community and I think doing that has, has, has helped me grow and develop and I think it's, it's almost something that keeps me on my journey and so I think it's just finding that higher purpose Beautiful, beautiful. I think it's been so great chatting to you. I think this has been such an enlightening discussion. Um, thank you for allowing us to see into your world. <laughs> thank you for allowing us to see a little bit into your brain. And I think you you literally epitomize the quote I love by, which is a personal quote I developed. And it says, don't ever allow anyone to tell you that you're not good enough. And even if they say it, refuse to believe it. And so I think that would be my final encouragement to everyone on the call tonight. Um, uh, the, you know, earlier on where you said, this is not exclusive to the Malvins of this world. You know, um, it's going to take the same amount of energy to build a big company as what it is to build a small company. And so be encouraged, guys. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for the great comments coming through. Um, let me read a couple of them before we say goodnight. So, you know, saying great talk. Thanks, guys. Uh, Mirko saying grateful for this opportunity. Thank you. Dennis Love saying awesome discussion. Thanks so much, Malvin. Um, Kateko saying thanks, M. And um, Tombiza had to leave, <laughs> but she's grateful to uh, Elijah's giving some fire emojis in the, in the chat. So Malvin, final words from you, or are you good to go? No, look, first of all, thank you to everyone for, for joining. I mean, like, I don't discount the time of coming to listen and join a conversation. I think it's really phenomenal that we have this community, but also thank you to you, Darren, for your superlative and actually incepting the, the questions of the of the audience and being the voice of the people. I think more important to the East Square team as well for the invitation, I think for creating this forum for collaboration and, and conversation. Awesome stuff. That's Malvin Lubega, our own hero. Thank you so much for being with us. And thank you all of you for tuning in. Thank you for staying engaged. Thank you for being here. Enjoy the rest of your evening. And we will hopefully see you in episode six of Getting Real with Entrepreneurship. My name is Darren August. Have a good evening, everybody. Goodbye. Right.